okay so as you just saw the display just went to sleep and I can wake that up so I've reduced the exposure uh, so that you can see the display properly and what we are going to do is attach a few things and see how this works um, first of all let's do a quick let's do a quick uh, frequency generated test now I don't have another another oscilloscope to uh, measure the accurate frequency generation and uh, how actually how, how well it's doing it but we will take a look uh, we have an FPGA there is a few uh, there it will blink LEDs and uh, instead of using the internal clock it will use uh, the uh, a pin as an external clock and it will go through that so let's just go to the sign uh, the frequency generator setting which is this one we will keep it at a square wave and uh, we will slow it down to about 10 hertz so that will uh, give us a nice and slow start all right so we are back and as you can see there are leds flashing on the fpga we have a 10 hertz um, frequency being sent uh, over a uh, clock and uh, if I remove this you can see the LEDs will stop where they are because the clock has stopped and there's no edge and as soon as I connect it it will start again so this is just a functional demonstration and now as I increase um, the frequency of the clock generated by the DS213 uh, this thing will start to flash much more rapidly so this is 20 uh, still 10 okay um, this is 20 so a bit faster again uh, 50 much faster 20 10 and let's go higher 20 uh, 50 still noticeable uh, that it's blinking but like the green LED you can't tell um, and then we are at a hundred kilohertz where the green and one of the red LEDs is barely blinking uh, and then 200 uh, uh, 200 Hertz uh, where you can barely see a uh, couple of the LEDs blinking and 500 Hertz one LED might uh, blinking you can you might be able to see that if I move it around I'm not sure how accurately it's represented on YouTube but uh, and there we go at one kilohertz my eyes can see just one LED blinking and the rest and on camera I can see nothing blink and then we move to two kilohertz five kilohertz and all the way to four and eight megahertz where it switches off uh, because it's not as accurate so this tells you something uh, at two megahertz uh, it's still stable like my eyes can see a bit of flicker uh, at 4 megahertz square wave it kind of goes weirdly blinking uh, again not on camera which is not visible at 6 megahertz uh, there's surely something wrong going up there and on 8 megahertz it just stops and the default clock on the FPGA is 12 megahertz so there's no reason that the FPGA uh, or the design is actually not functioning properly uh, I, with, with the OSIS it shows around 300 odd megahertz um, as the uh, safe clock and again if I touch the probe a bit it starts to move so you can see uh, how like the 8 megahertz bit might be a bit problematic so you know I'm, I'm just touching the probe and yeah so it says it can go up to 8 megahertz I'm sure that's not a very good signal and uh, if we tone it down then sure everything works almost as expected where at 10 kilohertz I for some reason it just um, stopped and here we are at 10 hertz and yep still working so towards the upper end yes the uh, ADC on board might not able to uh, handle, log, uh, handle it and uh, let's see if we can change from square to something else and it might work so sine wave and let's move it up to so the sine wave sine wave only go up to uh, 20 kilohertz and again why am i running an fpga on a sine wave i don't know let's uh so yeah of course our uh, fpga aren't meant to run on sine wave so that's will be a bit problematic 
and here we are at square wave again so that was the uh, the function gen test uh, we'll move on to another FPGA where I have a small uh, CPU implemented which I'll talk about someday in a later video uh, but that also has RAM implemented and we'll take a look at some of the signals uh, that come uh, from uh, from the pins uh, and see how that is represented uh, across the analog channel and the digital channel so that would be a lot more interesting uh, all right I'll be back in a bit all right so we have another FPGA on board and this is the tiny FPGA BX and you'll see in a moment why I am sorrow with the alligator ground clip and here it is and that's all I have to hook on to a lot of the small boards that I work with don't have a large ground pads that are visible and that makes it kind of difficult to you know just use the alligator clip itself uh, and this is one of the examples so what I've done uh, I have the some RAM activity pin I'm not sure if it's just enable or write as well but I, I'm sure I think it's enabled because the uh, waveform is quite, uh, very uh, consistent so I have the enable pin here on, on pin, pin 6 the enable register and we have the LED register and we have a few uh, other uh, from register 1 uh, we have bit 1, bit 2, bit 3 and bit 4 on pins 1, 2, 3 and 4 and then the fifth bit is on LED uh, and then we have the RAM uh, on pin 6 so we'll see the waveform and how it looks I am at 200 nanoseconds uh, AC 1 volt per division um, and that's about it so uh, let's go for it uh, and when uh, this is the interesting thing I'll put the probe on the LED pin right here and when I power it on you will see some movement here uh, which I've, if I increase the resolution and I restart it you can see this particular movement that happened right now and this is the PWM stuff and uh, that happens uh, because when the uh, FPGA starts up uh, the LED in, is in a breathing motion so this is the LED doing the breathing animation and now this is blinking at very high frequency exactly how freq high frequency you can see it shows up 1.5 megahertz that is probably accurate enough uh, at 50% duty cycle so it's half uh, powered off half of the time and powered on and as you do um, increase it uh, it will correctly uh, tell you the frequency um, and which is at this much so we'll pause it we have hit the pause switch now we have captured it kind of and now we can go on the X pause or X position and we can move through the waveform and you can see this tiny window moving over there uh, and that takes us uh, to wherever we want and if there's an actual data line going in uh, then you will find uh, some history there so it's you don't have this just this amount of window the window is actually very large uh, about right about 10 or at least eight times the uh, size of what you see so you can capture and scroll through now one of the most uh, major complaints that I feel and I've also heard from other people um, is that the controls uh, aren't like a regular d uh, a digital oscilloscope where everything is um, on the device itself everything has a knob so the x position has a knob the y position have has a knob the trigger has a knob everything has a knob and you can just uh, use that everything has a button everything has a knob there's a very little to you know go into the option select particular stuff and there's very much of that going on you know to select every exposition for every channel i'll have to scroll through it also to select the trigger for every channel i'll have to scroll through it and uh, that will actually uh, ac uh, change it uh, or i can press this button and that will change it to the b channel the c channel and the d channel um, and then you have the X channel here so that's one of the major complaints doesn't bother me too much but then again I'm not used to uh, using a DSO uh, because I don't own one so that's one thing um, and uh, let's take a look at one of the digital inputs with the with, with the similar LED um, example and see how they respond so I have the digital input on channel 
C. I'll switch uh, the V trigger over to channel C. Turn off channel A. So you can see how much time this takes just to uh, capture only channel C and then we can go on and take a look at channel C. Uh, we can remove this from hold and uh, plug it on to the LED pin and start it on and you can see uh, now uh, because it's DC only it's much more clear as to what's happening uh, because it's filtering most of the AC noise out and again if I uh, power on that again you can see the PWM stuff working and that happening as well um, let's take a look at the and so you can see there's no frequency or duty so because you will have to then um, go down there and change that to purple well I mean yeah that's like that's one of the major issues even I'm feeling it now but again we'll be on the LED bit and you can see duty is again 50 51 percent uh, frequency is 1.6 1.5 megahertz and uh, on pin number six uh, you know duty is 30 40 43 percent at 3.13 megahertz pin number four uh, it's uh, it's 806 kilohertz pin number three goes to uh, a much slower and now you can see pin number three pin number two at 203 kilohertz pin number three was 395 and pin number one is going to be much slower at 100 kilohertz and again with uh, every other um, channel you can pause this and just have a look around uh, again for that you have to move your cursor to x pause and you know just take a look around there about what's happening so you can do stuff like uart capture and other things like that i have tried those work just fine again uh, one of the most um, most things i've been told is that this particular um, you know it takes time it's not a daily driver by any means it's it's when it's useful when you're out in the field you need something small that can fit in your pocket and that's the purpose and it completes the purpose very well now there are other options so if you go in press this button you have an option to save a wav file and load it back on for later use so you can just select that and it will uh, save it uh, and then you can move down you can uh, you can select the saved wav file you can save the buffer uh, which will take a screenshot uh, no which will do something else not take a screenshot will save a buffer of this you can save the um, points as a cvs um, output press and it will save uh, select the volume backlight and power down time what you also can do is save all the volume backlight and your current settings uh, with a key combination which i don't remember because i don't have an english user manual and uh, i don't know if that's done already or not but that is one of the things you need to consider uh, however, my contact at uh, DSO Mini was very, or Mini DSO, was very prompt in telling me what the exact key combination is. Um, but it was something like you press these two key together and it will like take a screenshot or something. Uh, let's move. And if you do this or this, it was one of the key combinations. So now it's calibrating. That's the calibration key combination which it just did okay now it's saving something it's saved and also went into calibration which was weird the other issue i had with with this was 
that the internal memory can only be accessed u- ac- access using Windows. Uh, if you format the internal memory for Linux, it will corrupt it and it will not be used by the DSO itself. It will say error or some weird stuff like that and it will not work. I have tried that. You can revert it so that it works with the or with Windows only and that's sadly how it is set up. Hopefully a f- future firmware update will improve on that. Uh, apart from that, I really like it. I have used it multiple times to debug stuff uh, with this uh, FPJ and, and other stuff. So with that said, I hope you like this video. Uh, do check these guys out. Uh, if you want a small, um, the verdict I, I guess finally is if you want a really small uh, DSO, uh, this is the one to go because this is apparently the only one available. It's also uh, apparently open source. So. Um, a, a really nice product I, it has been recommended by many people i know uh, they really like it uh, uh, even if it is flawed in some ways uh, it is a very recommended product so take a look you know uh, and uh, you know if you if you go into hackathons and uh, stuff like that where you need to debug on uh, on like an immediate notice uh, this will come in very handy so thank you so much for watching and i will see you all in the next one